Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Mackey, and you are watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota. Twice per month, I host a show about pediatric health topics where we take and answer your questions live. August is National Breastfeeding Awareness Month, and breastfeeding is also the topic today. Joining us for this discussion is Rebecca Hoopert, who is a lactation consultant and registered nurse at Mayo Clinic. Rebecca holds the highest certification by the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners and joins us today with great experience and knowledge in this area. It's going to be an interesting discussion today, so please send in your questions under the live video feed, and we will try our best to review them during the live video broadcast today. Rebecca? Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So as as moms that have experienced breastfeeding um, and as people in general, we hear a lot about how beneficial breastfeeding is for, for the baby and for the mom. But let's just have you review a little bit for us all the different benefits there are for breastfeeding. Sure, yeah, there's a lot for sure. Um, when I think about it, I try to kind of group it into a couple of categories. So thinking about the baby is kind of the main one, of course. Um, so when we breastfeed, kind of especially the colostrum, the first mouth coats the gut and, and kind of feeds all the right bacteria so that baby has a great start for a strong immune system. So we see babies who are breastfed have a reduced risk for respiratory illness, GI, issue, ear infections, mm -hmm. asthma, allergy, mm -hmm. cancer, there's right. a lot for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, breastfeeding leads to healthier babies, healthier children, and even mm -hmm. healthier adults. Okay. Another really cool thing about breastfeeding is that mom's immune system gets to partner with baby's immune system to provide the best protection. So mm -hmm. for example, let's say you take your baby to daycare and as you drop off, you see little Johnny's nose running in the mm -hmm. corner and little Lucy's hacking over there. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, okay, you hand over your yeah, sweet right. uh, three month old baby. Yeah. Um, when you're with your baby later that night yeah. and you're breastfeeding, mm -hmm. actually a little bit of baby saliva gets into the breast mm -hmm. and your body makes antibodies to that specific virus within hours and for the next couple wow. days. So you're providing protection so that your baby hopefully won't catch the cold that's going around at daycare. But even if he does, it would be a less severe illness and then it wouldn't affect him for as long. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. That is very cool. <laughs> what about any other benefits? Yeah, another yeah. one I think about for moms, of mm -hmm. course we do see some health benefits for moms mm -hmm. as well. Reduce risk for certain cancers mm -hmm. and diabetes. Um, you know, there's some information that it helps them to lose some of their maternity weight a mm -hmm. little quicker if they're mm -hmm. breastfeeding. Um, and I don't think you can overlook the convenience factor. Of course, it's not always easy to start with breastfeeding, mm -hmm. but once you're up and running, mm -hmm. it's super easy. You know, mm -hmm. your baby's crying at three in the morning, you can get up and just breastfeed. Yes. Whereas if you have to do formula or bottles, you have to go to the kitchen, you have mm -hmm. to make it, you have to warm it, you have to feed it, and then you got dishes. Right. <laughs> so there's a convenience factor for mom as well. A couple other things that I think about is like the financial benefit. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you are breastfeeding, uh, saves the average family about $1,500 to $3,000 annually for cost of formula and other equipment. So that's a lot of money. Um, and then one other thing that I think about when I'm thinking about benefits of breastfeeding is understated, but I think really important is the environmental impact of breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So we know that cows and dairy cows produce a lot of methane, which mm -hmm. contributes to the greenhouse gases, plus all the resources that go into the packaging and then shipping it across the country. So by breastfeeding, you're really reducing your carbon footprint. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, those are a ton of benefits. What about postpartum depression? Is that one that, that is often, I've heard mentioned sometimes it may reduce the risk of, of um, postpartum depression in women that are breastfeeding? Is that something that is this true? or? You know, I haven't seen the, yeah. the stats on that exactly. Okay. Um, I know that if you're having difficulty with breastfeeding, mm -hmm. that that can increase your mm -hmm. risk for postpartum depression. But right. I know I have seen some studies on like skin to skin. Mm -hmm. And moms who are getting that early skin to skin contact, especially in the first couple of weeks, will have right. decreased risk for postpartum depression and mood disorders. Okay. So even if you're struggling with breastfeeding, right. still doing that skin yes. to skin would provide some protection. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you mentioned in the first couple of days, it can be a little bit difficult. <laughs> um, we've both been through this ourselves. Yes. Um, I find that if your expectations aren't met, then, then you're not as satisfied with the process going forward. So what should women expect or how can they prepare themselves for breastfeeding? Yeah, I think it's a good idea to get a real realistic idea mm -hmm. of what it looks like in the first couple of days. So often it's portrayed in the media as, you know, easy and they jump right on right. And, and no problems whatsoever. Right. Most babies are really sleepy in the first 24 hours. A lot of them don't eat much mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a new skill that they're learning. So some of them are going to struggle a lot more than others. And then, of course, depending on um, different things with mom's anatomy and her health and how much she's mobile in mm -hmm. her bed, that can make things difficult too. So I think realistically you need to plan 
that it's going to be difficult to start mm-hmm. and that if it's easy it's better mm-hmm. um, but it's a big time commitment right. um, they come out kind of driven to be at or near the breast especially overnight they want to hang out there mm-hmm. they want to camp there um, mm-hmm. so uh, it's a lot of work up front but mm-hmm. absolutely what can women do during their pregnancy to help prepare them for this is there any type of education that you guys recommend yeah I think any kind of prenatal education is good of mm-hmm. course Mayo does offer some breastfeeding classes mm-hmm. as well as just in general classes for prenatal um, education. There's lots of stuff in the community as well. Mm-hmm. There's less formal groups um, and some people prefer like a doula or a one-on-one education mm-hmm. so that's all out there but mm-hmm. I think it's important to build your community mm-hmm. and so that you've got those supports because it is a struggle for right. a lot of women and not not just in the beginning but as time goes on it's nice to have someone to bounce bounce it off of you know to be able to say that oh yeah I went through that too and hang mm-hmm. in there and it's gonna mm-hmm. get better or you know we tried this or we tried that so I think women um, really need a community of support so finding that if you don't have that with your friends and family um, finding it somewhere else in the community is a good idea absolutely and so people that aren't um, being seen at Mayo Clinic there's going to be prenatal breastfeeding classes most places right yes and there's hospitals organizations like like the Lolichi League and yes. other things would have support networks and support groups as well right yes that's okay. a really good point most okay. hospitals do offer prenatal classes the LHA League is a wonderful resource it's in most communities mm-hmm. for people that are in more rural areas or don't have access to that kind of thing there's online communities yes, too so yes. that's important to realize that we are in a um, resource rich environment yeah. but not everybody is but there's still resources that people can tap into out there fantastic all right so let's take it through you mentioned a little bit about what to expect in the first three days but let's kind of go through what what is breastfeeding actually like how frequently is it happening how is it occurring what should moms know Yeah, you know, the goal with breastfeeding is always baby-led feeds. So we want babies to be in charge of the feed pattern, and the vast majority will be able to do that as Mm -hmm. long as we don't restrict the access to the breast. Okay, well, how how would that happen? (laughs) Well, if you, if baby had just been feeding, Mm -hmm. let's say you just got done with a 30-minute feed, and you just set baby down, and baby starts looking interested again, Uh it's easy to assume, like, oh, we just did a feed, do a passy, or you hold them for a little while, when the reality, especially in the first few days, is that they do cluster feed or group their feeds together and they feed so I always say sporadically and unpredictably (laughs) that you just need to be ready to put them to breast at any moment okay it settles down as your melt comes in and you fall Mm -hmm. into more of a pattern but especially in the beginning um, you know we're really encouraging um, anytime baby looks interested to put baby to the breast and Mm -hmm. if baby isn't looking interested in that first couple of days Mm -hmm. to wake and offer every two to three hours okay the goal the ultimate goal is for babies to be feeding about 10 or more times in 24 hours so 10 or more in 24. Mm-hmm. So if, I like that. Yeah. That's good. You, you should copyright that. Um, so what if they aren't feeding that much? Um, is, is there a significance for milk um, coming in or milk production? Will it affect that? Yeah, you know, one of the biggest things we're finding that um, helps with milk production volumes as well as mm-hmm. when it comes in is, is what happens in that first hour or two okay. after delivery. That's usually what most babies are willing to try. Okay. You know, every most kids right. come out pretty active and interested in feeding. So if we can capitalize on that when mm-hmm. we're off to a really good start, mm-hmm. if we can't capitalize on that, if there's a separation or if baby just can't figure it out, doing some sort of hand expression in the first mm-hmm. hour or two can significantly change okay. how much milk you're going to be able to get out. Okay. Um, other than that, if you get a good feed and babies are sleepy, you know, we kind of watch and see mm-hmm. how things go. If we can't get babies to turn around, we'd like to initiate some sort of stimulation for moms mm-hmm. within 12 to 18 hours at least um, with either pumping or hand expression to protect mm-hmm. that milk supply. Okay. Um, what is hand expression? Can you explain a little bit more about it? Yeah, hand expression um, is a specific technique used to help move milk from the breast. Mm -hmm. So pumping is another way to stimulate the body, but oftentimes in the first few days, women get nothing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They kind of hook up to the pump Mm -hmm. and they see a couple of drops, which is discouraging for them. Um, It still meets the goal of stimulating the breast, but it doesn't give you any volume to Mm -hmm. feed the baby. So hand expression has been shown to be more effective and, and you kind of cup your breast and have your hand in a wide C and you Mm -hmm. press into the chest wall and then you compress deep. So it's counterintuitive because Mm -hmm. most women want to try to pull milk forward or like milk it down. But in fact, there's a really nice technique and there's a video out there. Jane Morton does a video from Stanford University that you can watch online to um, that details it a little bit more. But again, it's like into the chest wall and then together. Okay, fantastic. Um, What are the differences between claustrum and breast milk, especially in terms of volumes? You talked a little bit about 
difference of nutritional value too, but maybe you could talk more about that. Yeah, so in the, in the beginning, the volumes are small, very small. Mm -hmm. We would anticipate in the first 24 hours that the average feed volume, like per feed, is somewhere between two and 10 milliliters. Right. And for people who don't know what that looks like, if you have a teaspoon and you fill it full, it's about three to four. So like one yeah. teaspoon full yeah. is, is a full feed volume for babies. Yeah. So it does increase pretty significantly mm -hmm. each day, um, but the volumes are small, but the, the colostrum is packed with protein and antibodies and they don't need a lot of it to start. Um, and it, you know, when we talk about milk coming in, that we're looking for an increase in the volume and people oftentimes will say, well, I don't have milk, I have colostrum mm -hmm. right now. But in reality, colostrum is milk, it's just the first milk. Okay. So milk doesn't really come in per se uh -huh. as it increases in volume, although that's right. a very common saying yeah absolutely or misunderstanding um a lot of times when we work together in the nursery and seeing new babies and families and stuff they're very concerned that their baby's going to get dehydrated can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about how the classroom does fit their needs for um for hydration in that first couple days? Yeah, um, so again, because it's loaded with protein, it, it helps to kind of carry them through and babies come out really well fed and well hydrated. So they've got that cushion. A lot of times I'll say they came out having eaten Thanksgiving dinner and they brought a sack <laughs> lunch with them, right? So yeah, they don't need right. as much volume in the right. beginning to get them through. Right. So right. the dehydration is, is always a potential and we're watching closely. The main thing we wanna pay attention to is swallows at the breast. If okay. we can hear that baby is swallowing at the breast, mm -hmm. we know that they're moving milk. Um, we also watch weights um, as long as, as well as wets mm -hmm. and dirties to kind of fill mm -hmm. us in. Mm -hmm. um, but the volume need is small and they don't tend to get dehydrated through those first couple of days if they're eating something. Absolutely. I'll tell parents that, you know, nature's really figured this out. You know, like you said, they come in with a lot of extra and they also have hormones that are going to kind of allow them to retain a little bit of their fluid and then diurese it later as, the, as they start to get more um, intake with colostrum or breast milk at yeah. the breast. Yeah. So those are, those are, um, nature really does have it figured out. So yeah. um, it's not uncommon for a baby to lose up to 10% of their breast weight or, or not their breast weight, their, <laughs> their body weight, excuse me. Um, and so, and that doesn't usually concern us a whole lot, right? You, right. Yeah, so when when would their parents are often saying like, my baby's not getting anything, I need to do some formula. Can you address that a little bit more? Yeah, I always encourage them to really look at the big picture. Okay. So, you know, sometimes we do have the weight losses that are getting closer to mm -hmm. that 10%. And we do see, uh, tend to see a bigger weight loss with our c-section babies too Absolutely. so it's kind of providing that reassurance that you know we don't want to focus on any one number too mm -hmm. much we want to be aware of all of the numbers but exactly. if baby is coming in and actively eating and swallowing at the breast mm -hmm. even if they're losing weight they're still making wet and dirty diapers it, it can be totally fine, exactly. right? Um, we don't want to dismiss mom's concerns though, because moms are very intuitive and, mm -hmm. and sometimes they, they catch on to things, yep. you know, before absolutely. we do. So we just want to make sure we're right. making that full assessment. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. always I'm just telling them swallows, swallows, swallows yep. is the biggest thing. And if baby is swallowing, we're usually mm -hmm. doing okay, even if absolutely. we are getting higher weight losses in those first right. couple days. And following, you mentioned, I just want to reiterate that point is following their output is so important. Yes. So if they are making the number of wet diapers that we want per day, then I think we're probably Probably doing okay that's a good indicator too of what's going in them yes um, as opposed and what's coming out of them yeah so. and I would always advocate too that if they're concerned especially once they're at home mm -hmm. to just call their provider and get mm -hmm. more frequent weight checks absolutely every once in a while you'll have a kiddo who is having wet and dirty diapers but the weight gain is too slow absolutely. or not not yep. adequate so if again if that mm -hmm. your your gut is telling you mm -hmm. something is not right listen to it and just verify rather than right. change your feeding plan yes. and bringing formula yes. in right. get the weight checks and make absolutely. sure we don't want to miss anything but we don't want you to, to change your plan if it doesn't need to be changed. Absolutely. I'm just going to um, pony on that point a little bit more. So we do want babies to be seen within about 24 to 72 hours after being discharged from the hospital. Mm -hmm. So as a primary care pediatrician, I'm seeing them. And if they are continuing to lose weight and breastfeeding is not going well, we are going to bring them in, you know, in a day or two or another day and even on the weekend sometimes. Yeah. Um, so work with your provider, you know, work um, work with them to kind of figure out the best plan so your baby isn't getting dehydrated and getting into getting into some serious problems down the road. Yeah. So. And certainly, especially, it, you know, um, we're having more complicated deliveries and, mm -hmm. and higher risk moms who are able to conceive and have yeah. babies, which is right. awesome, but yes. but certainly those things can cause a delay in their milk coming in. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes things take a little bit longer. Sometimes it is definitely safe to wait it out and mm -hmm. other times we intervene, but yeah. exactly your primary yeah. care provider will guide yeah. you through all of that. It, I think with everything with breastfeeding, the best advice I can give people is to be flexible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's, it's, it's usually your expectations are never going to be what you think they is gonna are going to be. And so if you can be flexible and just kind of go with what your your baby and what you need at that moment 
things are going to be just fine in the end. Yeah, and just like you said earlier, we were talking before the show, yeah. is that every baby is different. So right. what you had happen with yes. your first one could yes. be completely different right. with your second or third. Yeah, when I when I see the babies and I round in the nursery, um, moms, like second or third time moms will sometimes say, like, you know, they're not latching as well. I'm like, you know what, every baby is different. Let, let's get Rebecca in here <laughs> <laughs> to help you kind of work through this um, because you guys will have to learn to drive the car together, you know. Yeah. So. Great way to put it. Okay, so let's talk about some cues. You mentioned putting baby's hand to their mouth and stuff. What are some cues that parents should look for to know when to put that baby on the breast? And what are some signs that it's too late, like that baby's too angry sometimes? Sure. You know, most babies wake up in a real kind of pattern sequence. They mm -hmm. usually kind of start wiggling and moving a little bit, <laughs> then they mouth just a little, mm -hmm. smack their lips or lick. You see their right. tongue coming out, and then the hands come up, and then they're kind of on those, and then they start rooting, which is where they're like actually looking, right? Mm -hmm. Our mouth is opening and they're turning side to side um, and then if those sub signals are all missed then they typically start to whine or cry so we usually consider crying a late sign mm -hmm. of hunger saying that right. we miss some of those earlier ones right. now certainly there are babies who just wake up and go like yeah. zero to six, <laughs> six <laughs> and don't feel bad if you have one of those right, right. Um, but essentially especially in the early days mm -hmm. if baby has been sleeping for any period of time and they are starting to yes. wake up it is likely they are yeah. going to want to eat yeah. so it's nice to get to them quicker when you get to them and they're just kind of getting ready for feeding they're more organized they're mm -hmm. more ready to latch and that right. more um you know kind of aggravated they yeah. get yeah, yeah it's harder for them to organize and harder for you to get them in place because they start you know wiggling more and more so I encourage you to get a baby to breast as quickly as you can mm -hmm. and if you're there and baby's just frantic and struggling you know a lot of times you you might just have to take a break a quick break because mm -hmm. you know baby wants to eat but mm -hmm. calm them down a little bit and come back um and any again with that expression anytime you can bring a little milk forward for them to smell mm -hmm. or taste that can help to calm them down when they're frustrated at breast and right. get them to latch well let's talk about a little bit about latching and positions okay. um, and we have some diagrams here that can show us um the different positions can you tell us that the a little bit more about these positions and yeah, so these are real common positions that we'll see in with breastfeeding. The left one, the cradle hold there is a little bit more of a relaxed in arms hold where baby's head is in um, mom's elbow and that can work well. Um, the other one is the cross cradle hold and that provides a little more structure for babies. So most often when we're working with moms in the hospital or in the beginning or if you're having pain with your latch, we encourage you to go back to something that's a little more structured like the cross cradle hold because it gives you more control over baby's head and where you kind of plant your lower lip and how you get baby on. Um, so if, if you're having pain or struggling, um, structure can really help babies. Okay, and then we have some more positions here. Yeah, and so again with that cross cradle and football are probably the main ones we use um, in the hospital. So again, that football hold on the far left there, um, again, providing that structure because you have a hold of the back of baby's head and you can kind of help to guide them onto the breast. Um, the side lying position on top and the laid back position are wonderful to, for moms to relax, especially if their bottoms are sore following delivery. Sometimes they don't want to be sitting up straight. Mm -hmm. um, the side lying position is can work in the first couple days. It's one that usually is a little easier. Mm -hmm. The better baby is at latching independently because yeah. you're down an arm there, so you're working with one hand. Um, but once you guys are up and running, those positions are great because babies spend so much time at breast, mm -hmm. it's nice to be able to offload from your bottom and just kind of really lay back and relax throughout the feedings. Okay, how do we know a latch is a good latch? Yes, this Can't is very important, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, when we're thinking about latch, we want baby's mouths to be really wide open. We want their lips to be flanged or rolled out. We like the whole cheek and chin into the breast. The nose can be touching or slightly away from the breast, but mm -hmm. we always want the chin to be touching or kind of buried in. Okay. Um, and then we're looking for things to be comfortable. We have some pictures of this too. Should we use yeah, that as let's you're kind of walking through? Okay. Yeah, in this one, mom is using more of that relaxed hold again with a cradle position, but you can see that she's aiming the nipple up towards the roof of the mouth. So when we're thinking about latch, we really want babies to land in an off center way so that their lower lip is actually further from the nipple than their upper lip. Um, so by aiming the nipple higher up towards the upper lip or the nose, you help to just ensure that baby is gonna get on the breast both deep and off center. Um, other big things that we look at when we're, we're thinking about latching on and if it's good is comfort. We would anticipate a little soreness and tenderness as you get up and running, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we're hoping that it's not really pinchy or painful mm -hmm. and we're hoping to avoid any kind of damage mm -hmm. on the breast. Typically mm -hmm. those things are latch related. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we can take a peek at is the shape of mom's nipple. When she comes, baby comes off of the breast, we want it to be really round and pulled mm -hmm. out. If it's looking pinched or compressed or misshapen, um, people often use like a new tube of lipstick as a marker. Yeah. Those are typically latch 
watch related um, as well. Okay, you just reminded me of something. What about the cramping that women experience, like their uterine cramping when they're breastfeeding? What's going on there, and is that okay? Yes, we would mm-hmm. we would expect that they'll have that. It's mm-hmm. usually the worst in the first couple of days, okay. and and that's a release of the oxytocin hormone that we want when babies mm-hmm. are breastfeeding. So it causes a lot of cramping, but it also can cause them to feel super sleepy, <laughs> like your eyelids just get so heavy, <laughs> um, and it can make you feel really thirsty too. And it's all that same <laughs> yes. hormone. <laughs> yes, I remember feeling like a camel. Like I can't have <laughs> water right now. Give me some water. Give me something to drink. Yeah. So, so it's a really good idea to keep mm-hmm. something close by where you nurse because we want Absolutely. you to get enough fluids yeah. in. Yeah. And if you drink every time you're right. thirsty, you'll get yeah. enough. Right. Um, so if you have something that you can grab, yeah. that's a good idea. Otherwise, by the end of the feeding, that sensation can pass and you right. might not drink as much. That reminds me of something that partners can do. Um, yes. Getting getting the water, um, making sure it's sitting next to wherever they're, they're nursing. What are some other ways that partners can help support the breastfeeding mom? Yeah, you know, to be be present and supportive is huge. Okay. We find that parents, uh, uh, fathers, or partners who are supportive of mm-hmm. breastfeeding, those moms tend to breastfeed longer okay. and more likely to meet their feeding mm-hmm. goals. So partner support is huge, even if they can't do the feedings, mm-hmm. right? Um, but like you said, they can provide water or snacks, sometimes just getting the pillows, helping with position like that. Extra um, hands. Yes. I feel like you need an octopus hand sometimes to get a baby <laughs> Get a baby Because they're all hands yeah. up there yeah. trying yeah. to help out, right? So sometimes it's yeah. a matter of holding they a little bag. Kitten, trying to need the mama's breast. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, and sometimes for, for families who are really struggling, I'll even have the dads come mm-hmm. over and kind of show them how am I helping and here you can hold they can this help and you can help too, this. Right? Yeah. yeah. You can teach them to kind of look to see what where is that chin at because sometimes it's hard for that mom to see too. Yeah. So yeah. good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit later. So we're past maybe the first month or so. Um, we're starting to go into month two um, or three. How frequently should an infant be breastfeeding at that stage? Does it slow down? Um, it will slow down okay. for the first couple of days. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it kind of stays at that 8 to 12 mark okay. throughout the duration of breastfeeding. And again, the goal always being baby-led feeds okay. because it is dependent upon how much milk that mom holds in mm-hmm. the breast. And some don't hold as much and their babies need to eat more often mm-hmm. and others hold a ton and they babies eat less often. So we know that things tend to fade mm-hmm. back and fall into more mm-hmm. of a natural pattern, but we're always encouraging baby led feeds and honestly for every family that can look different. Yes. So you hear like, oh, your baby should be sleeping through the night at four months of mm-hmm. age. And it's just not true for some families. Mm-hmm. If that baby isn't eating in the middle of the night, they're not gonna get enough milk to gain right. weight. And if right. that milk isn't removed frequently, mm-hmm. mom's mm-hmm. milk supply is gonna slow right. down. So right. it's one of those things where scheduling feedings um, is a usually a bad idea mm-hmm. for for babies just kind of letting them be in charge but again in general eight to twelve feedings is going to stay Stay, stay consistent. Stay consistent. How about what about in when we start to introduce um, complementary foods? So we're starting to introduce uh, vegetables, fruits, baby cereals, or after six months of age, um, d- will it decrease at that point? Usually it does, but okay. the introduction is pretty slow. Yeah. <laughs> so there, you yeah. know, it's a tablespoon or two mm-hmm. of, of food that you're starting mm-hmm. with, but they will. And and again, babies tend to do that on their own as they start to eat more food. They eat less at the breast, or yep. when they come to the breast, they're not taking as much milk. Um, so again, things tend to just kind of fade out. Um, uh, on their own. Absolutely. Um, I kind of have a question going back to Latch. What if a mother is out of the hospital, maybe where she doesn't have as many resources? What can she do? Um, what kind of resources might be available in her community to help her with breastfeeding support going on after discharge from the hospital? Yeah, so you get a lot of intense support those first yes, couple of days, yeah. but people struggle beyond that time frame for yeah. sure. That's where we see a large drop off in the percentage of women that are breastfeeding. Yeah, we yeah. lose the most in the first two weeks, mm-hmm. right? And so right. if we can provide a little more support there, then that that's wonderful. Again, hopefully there's something at your hospital where you have an outpatient lactation mm-hmm. consultant that's available. Um, if they don't offer that, then like the Leche League is mm-hmm. usually an option. They, they are um, more and more baby cafes popping up, which is kind of informal drop-ins okay. where you can get support. And if again, if you're in a rural community where you just do not have that mm-hmm. kind of support, there are online resources that okay. you can use and people you can tap into there as well. And then if you are in a rural, more rural community, oftentimes those doctors are more mm-hmm. versed, right? Because yes. they do it all. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, that even your doctor or your nurses at the at right. your primary care provider can yeah. help you with troubleshoot some right. of that stuff. And there may be people who have like a lower certification than you do called a CLC that might yeah. be um, present at some of these these sites. Like I know we have them at our, our clinics, our outpatients clinics 
and they can do some outpatient visits with them or phone visits and things yes, to help walk through absolutely. Problems. And as yeah. you mentioned, phone yeah. visits, there's actually mm-hmm. a couple of hotlines like the oh, you know, the government has one that's Great. out there. And I think maybe La Leche League, an 800 number okay. um, with a little bit longer extended hours. So if you're having trouble, maybe Great. past the time your doctor's office is closed, okay. those are free and available as well. Okay. As we're starting to get close to the end of our time, I want to talk about a couple other common breastfeeding questions or concerns that you might see a little bit later. Let's talk about supply. I think yes. supply is, is a big one. What what uh, about a woman is concerned about her supply or maybe the baby isn't gaining weight as um, rapidly as we would want them to? What mm-hmm. are some things that we can do to increase supply or things that we should be asking mom about? Yeah, so I think a main thing we want to know about is the frequency of the feeds and okay. kind of swallows that we're hearing. Um, if mom is behind, it's typically trying to get extra milk out. So we will have them pump behind the feedings to try to get a little bit more milk movement, mm-hmm. that kind of thing, or bring baby to breast a little more often if that's a possibility. Um, you know, it really depends on and the cause of the low supply is certainly there are women, despite heroic efforts, just cannot yes. produce enough milk. Right. And we need to, to be realistic mm-hmm. about that as well. Mm-hmm. So make sure that they're doing everything that is mm-hmm. optimal to encourage supply um, and then bridging it where we mm-hmm. can't. What about medications? Sometimes in the past there has been um, some prescription medications or herbal medications that have been used to increase supply. Is that something that it's useful or has evidence behind it? There is some good evidence behind uh, behind, uh, Domperidone and and a little bit behind the Raglan, Mm -hmm. although the Raglan has some side effects, so some providers are a little nervous to do Mm -hmm. it, especially um, because one of the side effects is depression Mm -hmm. in women, and we're already in a high-risk category for Mm -hmm. sure. Um, So the Domperidone is is well-researched with low side effects, but not currently available in the Mm -hmm. United States, so they Mm -hmm. use it in other countries very successfully. Um, Raglan would be a possibility if you knew the reason that you had a low supply was because of low prolactin levels, right. um, because it helps to raise those. Um, lots of herbal concoctions mm-hmm. out there and, and lots of marketing towards mm-hmm. it. Ultimately, the research is just spotty. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so as a, as a group, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine doesn't typically recommend a whole lot of okay. that. Um, Some women feel like it makes a big difference and Mm -hmm. a lot of them feel like it doesn't help at all. But Mm -hmm. fenugreek would be like kind of probably the most commonly used herbal supplement. We hear Mm -hmm. about that one a lot. Um, And in high doses, which you typically need, um, it can cause GI upset in the mom and in the baby and it Mm -hmm. does interact with some medications. So I encourage anybody who's considering herbal medications to be sure they've talked to their provider about it before they start. Um, But again, if we've done everything else, Mm -hmm. you know, it it might be worth a try some of those other things. Okay, fantastic. So um, our last question then would be about, what about the moms that are getting ready to return to, into the workforce mm-hmm. um, and that want to continue to express breast milk? Um, how can they start to prepare for that or increase their supply and plan for how much they will need to pump during the day? Yeah, that's a great question because so many of us do have to return to yes, work for right, sure. Exactly. Um, you know, a lot of the official recommendations are to wait four to six weeks before you start yep. pumping. Um, I tend to favor starting a little bit earlier mm-hmm. because I've worked full time yep. after after having a couple yep. of kiddos and I've worked with many people yes. who have also done that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the problem with starting too early, the concern would be that we're going to cause an oversupply Absolutely. problem or yep. we're going to take away from the baby mm-hmm. um, or we don't want moms to focus on feeding the freezer. We want them to feed the baby. Yeah. Um, but there's there are safer ways to incorporate pumping earlier Mm -hmm. and typically what I would recommend is around two weeks earlier or later depending on an individual situation Mm -hmm. um, starting once a day and you have the most milk first thing in the morning so wake up in the morning prioritize baby at Mm -hmm. breast and pump right after that Mm -hmm. feeding if you start that at two weeks and you have 12 off you can accumulate a lot of milk in the freezer Mm -hmm. a cushion of milk in there without pumping a whole bunch throughout exactly. the day. Exactly. So that cushion, you know, will get you through an illness or mm-hmm. will get you through an unexpected event or um, later in lactation when yes. you struggle. You know, most yeah. women will do really well when they first get back to work that right. f- three, four months. And then by nine, 10, we're getting the phone calls yeah. like, I can't keep up, my right. freezer supply is low. Yeah. Um, so that cushion can help bridge that and get you Perfect. closer to your goal too. So, I, so I'm so i a um, little bit of a fan of starting early. Yeah, and I then, agree. I did that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then I think it's a really good idea, too, to make sure that you've talked to your um, employer about mm-hmm. your plans to continue to pump before you get back. Perfect. Let's talk really quick about yeah. what, what are the laws available in the United States that help um, ensure women being able to continue to breastfeed? So every state's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. There's a federal law out there mm-hmm. as well. So here in Minnesota, um, you know, the state law reads that a woman should be able to breastfeed are to pump at any reasonable amount of time that she needs throughout right. the day. So it doesn't specify open, a time, right? Yeah. right? And um, they need to provide them a space, right, to also do the, the pumping. Yes, yeah. most places yeah. it, it is recommended, especially mm-hmm. if the employer is big enough. Mm-hmm. Some of them are exempt right. if they're smaller yes. employees or, you know, if it's a right. one-room um, 
shop they right. might not have the option to do that yeah. um, but yes it'd be nice for them to uh, do a space too but as far as scheduling and expectations if you have talked to your employer and right. they know you're planning to pump when you come back you don't have that stress of coming in and feeling like mm -hmm. nobody knows you're gonna do it or doesn't mm -hmm. want you to do it right. most women are gonna need to pump about every three hours when they yeah. get back we want you to try to keep a similar schedule to what baby is um, feeding and then usually again as you go further out you can maybe start to space those a little bit more as baby starts to space more at home okay what about a breast pump last question I promise yeah <laughs> um, our, our breast pumps are expensive um, and uh, our insurance companies covering them so they have been um, mm -hmm. with the Affordable Care Act there was some nice protection for moms that were breastfeeding mm -hmm. um, some of that stuff is getting rolled back and we're seeing some of that mm -hmm. um, now in, in the laws as well but a lot of uh, insurances still are providing okay. a breast pump it's really important that you contact them you know use your card on the back mm -hmm. and just see what you're eligible for because some of them are specific about where you get your yes. breast pump or what breast pump right. you get or when you get your breast pump right. and so if you pick it up at the wrong time or at the wrong place you could get uh, a bill that you were yes. expecting right absolutely um, but hopefully most are, are providing that not all are okay fantastic this was wonderful thank you so much for joining us and just sharing all of your knowledge about about lactation and breastfeeding yeah it was fun it went really fast it did go really <laughs> fast thank you everyone who watched us um and please, you can catch the next ask the mayo mom live on august 23rd at 11 a.m um joining us will be guests uh, dr sherry driscoll and dr william shaughnessy to discuss spina bifida which is a birth defect that affects the spinal cord and other areas as well um, it will be a great discussion thank you everyone and have a wonderful day